My name is David Miller. Um, I'm a professor of mechanical engineering. I've been here at Cal Poly almost 34 years now. Um, primarily, I teach courses in the energy systems area, um, alternative energy systems, nuclear engineering, heat power, which is a power plant design analysis class, internal combustion engines. I also teach thermodynamics. I've taught other courses over the years, but primarily energy related courses. Thermodynamics, as the name implies, is all about energy and the movement of that energy. So the thermodynamics course would always begin with some basic discussion of various substances and the properties of these different substances. Um, we learn about the thermodynamic data that's available to students. Um, we ultimately utilize this data in solving relatively simple problems, um, but ultimately moving to problems that involve the first law of thermodynamics, which is just another name for conservation of energy. Um, we look at problems that are both closed system, in other words, fixed mass, as well as variable mass problems, in other words, problems involving flow. Um, we deal with problems that use substances like water or refrigerants where we have really good thermodynamic property data, but we also involve um, problems with liquids or gases or solids where perhaps we don't have as much property data. Um, once we have the basic concepts, uh, then we look at the first law itself. Um, and then we look at variations of the first law for different types of processes. Um, then we get into what would be called the second law of thermodynamics, where we understand that there's limitations as to the processes that could occur. Um, and then we start looking at all sorts of real world types of examples. Um, we look at cycles, um, in other words, heat engine cycles, which is what power plants and engines are based on. We look at refrigeration cycles, which is what refrigerators, freezers, air conditioners are all based upon. Um, we look at other types of problems that would be involved with real world, so um, air water vapor problems, problems that are involved with air conditioning, we look at combustion problems, um, we look at problems involving gas mixtures, so it's a, it's a very wide-ranging course that covers a lot of different topics. Thermodynamics is offered in the junior year. Um, by the time they are ready to take thermo, they've already had you know, two full years of math, a full year of physics, um, a lot of their basic sophomore level engineering courses. So they're finally ready, they finally have the maturity, if you will, to deal with the thermodynamics. Um, the thermodynamics deals with energy and how energy is transformed. So it's really just one part of a multifaceted discipline called mechanical engineering. Um, in, other areas of mechanical engineering, we would deal with materials, we would deal with mechanics, which is the study of motion, we deal with heat transfer, we deal with fluid mechanics. Um, but in the thermodynamics class, uh, we're looking specifically at the flow of fluids and the energy associated with them. We, we talk about heat, we talk about work, um, and in fact, the thermodynamics is really what gives you the data necessary to do some real mechanical design. If you're designing a pump, um, you need to know what materials to use. You can't select that material unless you know what kind of pressures and temperatures, what kind of flow rates you have. So thermodynamics is just one of many. It's, it's not the, the best or only discipline within mechanical engineering. It's just part of a bigger puzzle. Um, when the students have finished thermo and all these other mechanics and heat transfer and materials courses, et cetera, et cetera, then they're capable of becoming mechanical engineers. These jobs will be in many, many different areas. It could be in the area of power production. It could be in the area of oil refining. Um, it, it could be in propulsion systems, dealing with flow of high energy fluids. Um, it could have something to do with internal combustion engine design. Um, and it could be just little pieces of all those larger systems. Um, you'd have to utilize it if you're involved in designing pumps or heat exchangers or turbines or compressors or any of these various types of mechanical devices. So it's, it's very useful and, and necessary. I can't tell you exactly how many times I've taught it, um, probably for 20 years or more. So let's say several dozen times I've taught the course. And as far as the tools used by students, um, it really hasn't changed. I mean. When you get right down to it, the basic thermodynamics has not really changed in 100 years. Um, certainly, some of the more complex problem-solving tools have changed. There's a lot more computerized methods, numerical methods for solving problems, but that's well beyond the junior level thermodynamics course. So I would really have to say that things have not changed much at all. Um, if anything, 
Um, computers are more powerful, um, there's a lot more databases that are available, so I think it makes it a little bit easier for students to solve problems. Um, but the concepts haven't changed, the tools haven't changed, they've just gotten a little bit faster. Okay, so I think with regards to most challenging, I, I would have to say um, anything dealing with entropy. You know, entropy is a thermodynamic property that we use to determine whether a particular process is possible or not. And, you know, it, it's not obvious like energy is obvious, temperature, pressure. I mean, people can make good sense of those, but entropy is a measure of randomness or disorder, and that just causes a lot of students grief, just, just trying to understand the basic concepts. Um, also, mixtures of gases, you know, it, it's hard enough to solve a problem when you have a single pure substance, but when you have mixtures of substances and trying to remember how to incorporate those mixtures into the problem, um, that becomes rather complicated as well. And included in that would be combustion problems. I mean, combustion is extremely important, um, but those are problems that involve mixtures. You've got air fuel mixtures that are burning into combustion product mixtures, and so therefore you have things that are reacting and things that are being produced, and they're not treated exactly the same. So that's also are rather complicated. Um, as far as what the students enjoy the most, I would have to say the cycle analysis. You know, when students finally get into the heat engine cycles and they're finally analyzing the basic processes involved with internal combustion engines, the processes involved with steam power plants, processes involved with gas turbine power plants, which are also just called jet engines. Um, those I think students find exciting because finally, after several years of mechanical engineering study and several months of thermodynamics, finally they're able to put all the basics together and solve a real world problem. Um, also refrigeration cycles, air conditioning problems. I think students really like that as well because it's very real. It's, it's not just a concept, it's real problems that students can understand have real benefits. You know, I grew up in the 60s and 70s um, in California. Air pollution was rampant. Um, we had gone through two energy crises. Um, actually, I would contend that we're still in the energy crisis, but it started in the 70s with our tremendous reliance on oil from the Middle East. Um, we needed to make a change. Um, we were polluting and killing our planet, we still are. Um, you know, we are trying to become less reliant on foreign sources of fossil fuels. Hopefully we can get rid of all of our fossil fuel use. Um, but that's really what motivated me. Originally I thought I was going to go into mechanical engineering and work in the solar energy business, but it just didn't turn out that way. I was given the opportunity to teach here at Cal Poly and this is where I've been for essentially all but the first five years of my career. Do all of the problems that have been assigned to you and understand them implicitly. Um, don't just try to memorize equations. Don't just try to be able to resolve the problems that you've seen on homework, but understand the basic concepts. Um, do extra problems if you have to, um, but know underneath what the problem solving techniques are. Don't just memorize things, but understand the processes. I think with regards to an engineering career, um, you have to remain flexible. You know, the basic tools you have in mechanical engineering will provide you with what you need for any career, whether it's as an engineer or a salesman, marketing, business, law, um, but use those skills and use them to your own advantage. Do what you want to do as a career. Don't think that just because you have a degree as an ME that you have to become a mechanical engineer. No, be what you want to be and use your mechanical engineering as a tool. Um, some of the best and most highly paid lawyers in the world are those with engineering degrees. Um, they're not engineers, but they are engineers. They're using that problem solving skills, or I say those problem solving skills, those techniques. So, you know, be willing to be flexible. Um, understand that the tools you have learned are not just design tools for engineers. And also make sure you have good communication skills. Um, you know, it's not enough to just be able to solve a problem by yourself. You need to be able to explain that to the people who are basically 
buying your services. I mean, you're working for somebody, you're getting paid a lot of money. Um, they want to know exactly what you're doing. So, you know, make sure you have the ability to discuss and describe what you're doing at any level, um, not just to fellow technical people like your other MEs, but also to the managers, to the supervisors, to the human resources people. I mean, you have to be able to speak at everybody's level so that everybody understands very clearly what it is that you're doing in your job.